Hello everyone, I'm Mr. Ryan Darcy, and it has been 20 days since I saw they came to rob Las Vegas for the very first time. And you may be thinking, for a show called Just Watched, I didn't exactly just watch the movie. <laughs> and you're right. I did actually record They Came to Rob Las Vegas, just like I did all my other episodes of Just Watch. And I just felt, looking back at the footage, I was like, well, you know what? I feel like I think I should change. I, I honestly should change up my style. And it's funny because about a year or two ago, I, I distinctly remember saying I might in the future start changing up my style for Just Watch This just to try and see if I can improve it. And a year or two later, I'm now finally jumping headfirst into the unknown with this. So the original review has officially been put away in the Darcy vault, uh, probably to be never seen again. But just like the Disney vault, uh, you never know. <laughs> Welcome to Just Watch This, episode 125. They came to rob Las Vegas. How my reviews normally work is I start off with the just before section, which is the part of my review where I record myself talking about the film before I've seen it. So I'm giving out my expectations for the film, uh, what I've heard about the film, uh, maybe uh, why I was inspired to go watch this film right here, right now, you know, stuff like that. The problem is I have seen the movie already, so I have to kind of give you a kind of, I guess you could say, Cliff Notes version of what I originally remember and what I said before I watched the film for the first time. The main reason I've decided to review They Came to Rob Las Vegas is because A, that title is very exciting because I'm like, oh, that sounds cool, dramatic, and straight to the point. I mean, you know exactly what you're gonna get with a movie called They Came to Rob Las Vegas. B, because this movie was made in the late 60s, I am hoping that you get some good footage of Las Vegas as it was back then. Because if you've ever been to Las Vegas recently, like I have, I visited in, in 2008, that's not really recent, but it's, I mean, compared to the movie, it's definitely quite recent. The skyline for Las Vegas has changed so much. Just like Diamonds Are Forever, the James Bond film, when I'm like, oh, it's going to have Vegas. Oh, I'm going to see what Vegas was a little bit like in the 70s. Granted, I was a little disappointed overall with the film and how much they used of Las Vegas in it. Um, I was kind of hoping for a little bit more more or in better uses of it but you know you can't can't be sad with what you what you do end up getting you know <laughs> c the cast lee j cobb was my main go-to for this movie i was like okay i definitely have to see it if he's in it he's been in such classics as 12 angry men on the waterfront the exorcist the only other notable cast member that I recognized in the name immediately was Jack Palance. I've seen him in, uh, well, I don't know if I've seen the entire movie from beginning to end, but I've seen a majority of, of City Slickers, and he's in it. But that's on obviously, compared to this film, is a lot more newer, and uh, he's obviously a lot more older in it. And so uh, it's going to be interesting seeing him when he's very young. So in 2006, Jack Palance was 87 when he passed away. Um, doing some quick math, and by quick math I mean calculator and editing, <laughs> he was around 38 years old when he did the movie They Came to Rob Las Vegas, which would mean he would be notably younger in this movie than he was in City Slickers, obviously. Those were th those were only the two notable cast members that I actually recognized name wise. That I was like, oh, okay, I should maybe check out this film. The other two I didn't recognize at all. 
until after I watched the movie and I looked it up and I can't believe I, I didn't recognize the guy from 2001 A Space Oddity, Gary Lockwood, which also that movie also came out in 1968, which is so weird because in 2001 A Space Oddity, Gary Lockwood's character actually looks several years older slightly and more adult wherein they came to rob las vegas after seeing the movie he's he he seems very like younger more teenaged more rebellious of the young adult type age you know that's what it like seemed like like a more young adult i just thought it was weird because both movies came out the same year and it's like two drastically different looks. It's amazing what two different productions can do to an actor, you know? And the second name, Elk Summer, I hope I'm saying these names correctly. She wasn't really, in, like, I, I, I'm I, looking through her filmography and I actually, I don't think I've seen any of these films. And this is even, even after seeing They Came to Rob, Rob Las Vegas, I don't remember seeing her elsewhere. Except for, I just got to The Wrecking Crew, which is a movie I need to check out because of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Which is actually a very good transition to D. The fourth main reason I had to check out this film is because, and actually, to be honest, I should have started off with this one, is that uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was when I first even heard... Of they came to rob Las Vegas because in the movie, in one specific scene in the background, you see a giant, not poster, but it's like, and I think it was painted on the wall type advertisement for that movie. And it is big and scrawling. And of course, Quentin Tarantino had to have that decoration, set decoration in the film because obviously it's another movie reference to probably a movie he likes and enjoys or loves who knows i figured i'm like okay if quentin Tarantino definitely either approved or suggested to have that billboard advertising that movie at that time on the wall there i'm like okay well then it must be a quentin tarantino approved movie in a sense so i'm like kind of have to check it out i mean quentin tarantino is only what my second most favorite director of all time definitely had to check it out i also have to check out the wrecking crew which actually was the came out the same year wow the more you know my expectations for they came to rob las vegas was i'm expecting it to be very good (laughs) like not good in the sense of like you know, Academy Award winning, um, very masterpiece of a film. I just thought it was going to be a very good film as a, as a just enjoyable and just well done overall. Like that's, was my expectation going in for they came to rob Las Vegas. And the only other films I had to maybe think maybe it could end up like that is the only other two movies that came to my mind that are around the similar time that I have seen is Ocean's Eleven, the original 1960 film with Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and uh, The Italian Job, which is 1969 with Michael Caine. Both involve heists in their own special ways. and But the funny thing is, Ocean's Eleven, if I remember correctly, involves robbing Las Vegas. And the, one of the reasons why I've seen that film is, well, because I, the Ocean Eleven remake was actually very entertaining. And I very well enjoyed the remake. And I really wanted to check out the original. And I like the original, but... I kind of, I I guess I was a little bit disappointed with it. I felt like the cast was like the better part of Ocean's Eleven, the original movie. But I thought it was a little bit cool, their whole, how how they executed or attempted to rob Las Vegas. I thought was very neat in and of its time for Ocean's Eleven. The Italian job, I actually, even though I can't really remember the movie that much, I do remember the ending, and I do remember how much 
I was, I was, I was kind of a little bit mad when I saw the Italian job, the original, because of that ending. And I just remember, I'm like, well, that was, I felt, I felt like I was robbed, per se, with that ending. And I have to, I have to, in all honesty, I do have to rewatch Ocean's Eleven, the original, and the Italian job original. Because, I mean, just recently, I actually... Within the last six months, if I remember correctly, I saw the Italian Job remake for the first time, and I thought it was neat for what it was, but in some ways was a bit of an improvement over the ending of the original. (laughs) But don't get me wrong, the Italian Job, the original, the ending is so memorable and is so... The very classic way to end the film, and to be fair... I, I mean, there's only two two parts I really remember from that movie. The ending and Michael Caine's famous line of... You're only supposed to blow the bloody doors off! But then again, I was younger when I watched The Italian Job and Ocean's Eleven, the original. I was That was like, that must have at least been ten years ago. And I'm in my 27th year of being on this earth, so that's kind of pretty young especially for somebody who was born in the 90s to watch older movies such as those (laughs) and actually had an interest in pursuing to watch those movies you know i'm kind of proud of that in a sense because i i'm sure most modern 17 18 year olds aren't like oh i have to track down this this old movie you know and watch it you know anyways (laughs) getting a little bit off track but for they came to rob las vegas which was in the 60s i felt like those two movies would be my go-to for comparison like if i am gonna rank or whatever so my expectations were that this movie is gonna be even better than those two and that's what i hoped for going in to see it depending on what i decided to name this episode you may already know the answer to what i thought after seeing the movie I think They Came to Rob Las Vegas is much better film than The Italian Job, the original, and Ocean's Eleven, the original. Much better, much more, more, much more entertaining to watch, much more just overall better for its time, I felt. <laughs> for now, I'm going to keep it spoiler free, so that way, if you want to watch a bit of this, but you still want to see the film before you actually go see my rest of my review... I'm doing this for you because I I don't I always be very conscious about spoilers because spoilers can definitely make or break a movie, especially if somebody knows ahead of time. Hey, uh, there's going to be a spoiler here or, you know, or ah man, I wish I didn't knew that because, you know, I would have maybe enjoyed the movie a lot more, you know. And so I'm I'm very cautious when it comes to spoilers. And, and that's actually partly the reason why I kind of wanted to remake this episode, so to speak, and reboot it. Because um, in my original review for They Came to Rob Las Vegas, I didn't spoil the movie at all. Like, I just felt like, no, I'm not, I don't want to spoil it. And the problem is I didn't even really talk about the film at all except for i think there was one aspect of the film i actually talked about the rest of it was very vague and i could have been talking about almost any other film and that's another reason why i kind of really wanted to revamp my just watch reviews the problem is i mean the movie is like a uh, quick math in my head um i don't know what 50 60 years old at this point and the fact that you can only, if you can find the movie f- on a physical copy, it's DVD. I don't think Netflix has the movie. I don't think Disney Plus has the movie. Turner Classic Movies might show it now and then on TV. Or uh, or maybe they have a streaming service. I'm not sure. They Came to Rob Las Vegas is a very hard movie to track down per se. Because there's only been one DVD, North America DVD release that I know of, and that's the one I bought. It's uh, Warner Brothers Archive Archive Collection. And it's kind of unfortunate because I I was actually kind of looking forward to a Blu-ray or uh, some sort of uh, a little bit maybe of a restoration of the film. I know it isn't exactly Ocean's Eleven, the original, because that one has both a DVD and a Blu-ray. 
I figured if it's definitely after seeing the movie, I kind of I can kind of see maybe uh, Arrow picking it up or something like that. And uh, why am I talking about the movie on DVD? Oh, that's why. Um, <laughs> why I'm not spoiling the film? And yeah, I, I'll be I'll be honest. It seems like in the majority of my reviews, it does seem like the movies I think are more bad, or the movies that I didn't really care for, end up being the movies that I'm like, oh, I'll just bluntly spoil it, you know? Where movies that I think are somewhat good or deserve to be watched and looked at i find those movies i'm like i'm not gonna spoil it go see it yourself you know and so i i should really stop that i should you know sort of treat movies the same as in you know what i'll do non-spoiler and then more towards the end of the video i will have the more detailed discussions about the film Going into all the good spoiler details and all that jazz. So to end my just before segment as well as my non-spoiler part of the review. Because I might as well at this point. Movie is good. I really enjoyed it. I think it's better than The Italian Job. And I think it's better than uh, Ocean's Eleven. Even though technically The Italian Job this special specifically the ending is so memorable that at least with they came to rob las vegas i don't know probably because it's the most more recently watched out of the free i don't know if it's that but i do feel like remembering this plot a lot more overall and just the way they did it like it just seems more the movie is going to be more mem more stuck in my memory than say the entire first half of the Italian job or Ocean's Eleven for that matter. So I would highly recommend if you have the option to watch the movie, check it out, especially if you like heist movies or um, older movies and even um, maybe maybe even some of the spaghetti westerns. I'm, I'm going to get into the, what I mean by that into in my more spoiler aspect of my review, but it's pretty good for what it is at that time they came to rob las vegas is mitchell darcy approved <laughs> now we get into the technically just after but uh more spoiler aspects of the movie so you have been warned from here on out i will be spoiling they came to rob las vegas Putting in the disc, I am reminded once again how bad a DVD or Blu-ray menu can be from Warner Brothers. <laughs> For the Archive Collection DVD, I'm not sure, I haven't tried any Blu-ray version of an Archive Collection. It doesn't even have a title of the movie, it doesn't have a picture of the movie or anything like that. It's just Archive Collection, one option to play the movie... It even gives you a little square thing to select something, but there's only one option, so you can't even exactly, you know, choose a different option if you wanted to, so I don't know why they have the little square to indicate where you are on the menu. Like, how, how can I get lost? There's only one option. And then uh, they have this whole little section just, just telling you that you can use the skip buttons forwards and back on your remote to navigate through the movie at exactly 10 minute intervals. They also want you apparently to check out website warnerarchive.com hashtag not sponsored because you know apparently I guess there's more information there or maybe even special features I don't know. <laughs> This movie has bare minimum nothing. It's just literally just the movie. And, and the DVD menu, just, oh. I, I didn't think they could get worse than the, um, like the movies like The Lucky One or Blade Runner 2049, where it's just, it has the, the little circles. And I'm like, well, at least with that menu, you actually know what movie it is. And it, they choose a decent or nice little photo of the movie in a sense. <laughs> compared to that 
this is this is definitely probably the worst menu I've ever seen. <laughs> it's not technically a bad menu. It does a job. It's just it's so mass produced. Like they probably slapped this on to any archive collection Warner Brothers movie that they want to put on a disc. Saves them time and money. They just, you know, slap that on the front. There you go. We can release almost any other movie now. <laughs> As a media collector, I am very critical about the, you know, either packaging or the menu. I like releases that do a good job. And, you know, I like menus where it's like it matches the film, doesn't spoil the movie, and just is a nice, pleasing menu overall, you know? <laughs> the movie itself starts off very dramatically with its choice of editing. It decided to do, like still images well at first you're not sure what's happening but then it's like it comes clearer that it's a, a prison break and the police are looking for this criminal who just escaped and it's just very it's a little bit jarring jumping into the film like that because it's like i actually thought there was a problem with my dvd at first <laughs> uh but then i realized no wait this is a choice that they made editing wise where it's they do still shots and then one of the still shots turns into live action and it sort of transitions to you seeing what's happening as he's escaping and overall it's it's pretty cool <laughs> it's just a cool little thing i mean they could just you know started it off right with the live action but the 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 still shots was just a very neat way of starting off the film i felt we discovered the one that's breaking out of jail is gino played by Gene Servas. I hope I'm saying that right. Right. He is most famous known for being in the movie, probably going to butcher the name, Rafifi, about a crime heist or whatever. I'm not entirely sure. I haven't seen it, but if I remember correctly, it is it is on the Criterion Collection. I think it was a movie that was a little bit on my radar. I'm reading here that it's actually on the top 250 uh, best films of all time, according to International Movie Database. And it's the definitely the movie that he's most famous for. But I'm not going to lie, when I first saw this film, I actually thought this guy, Gino, was the main character. <laughs> After escaping with the help of some friends, uh, he immediately is asking about someone and where they would be located. I believe we're not really sure what the relation is or anything. And um, then it immediately cuts to the club where this guy is at. And this is where we first meet Gary Lockwood. And actually, I didn't actually <laughs> realize this on the first viewing, but they, they actually show all the people he ends up working with later on in the film for the heist is in this club as well or a majority of them and so i just i thought that was a interesting detail that i kind of overlooked because later on you will see them again but um i actually thought that was the first time you've seen them i didn't <laughs> didn't realize you actually seen them in this club even though the more I, the more i rewatch this film the more i'm like yeah okay that was a little more obvious that that's them in the club and so the two suit guys that was in the car that help Gino escape from prison uh go into the club and of course they stick out like a <laughs> stick out like a sore thumb and then you got what arguably is probably my favorite side character in this movie just because of his lines of dialogue throughout the film and just the way he portrays it as Tony is being led out of the club this guy he passed says dear boy you do have colorful acquaintances they look like the supporting cast in a George Rapp picture and then the movie just goes dramatic <laughs> as it cuts to various people in the club. The people who end up helping with the heist later on. It was kind of their inter introduction in a sense. But it, it's just, it's just, it's kind of like, it's just kind of funny that it's like the line is built up as like, oh, these two suspicious guys in the suits, and they kind of look like they're from a movie and a certain type of movie and gangster type film. And it's like, and then you cut to like the the crew that helps with the heist later on very dramatically in such a way that it almost implies like this is the new crew. Like this is the new, the new gangster films in the sense. 
cast of characters and so it's it's kind of i i just i i really liked it and i kind of had to mention that tony's come across gino in the car and it's like having an old friend over for dinner it's like very happy and surprised to see each other kind of give off that vibe of old friends catching up a little bit it's never really talked about in the film at all per se like this this is literally the only scene we really have between these two characters and it's like it's trying to get a lot out of it obviously something happened previous tony made a mistake or whatever and gino or he thinks gino is still a little bit mad at him for it or whatever and i wonder if it has anything to do with the the him escaping from prison but we're not sure and then we sort of get into a little bit of conversation of almost uh new versus old per se and it's like and tony's talking about oh going to the moon and uh, how technology is improving and all that and and then gino's like oh well the old way is better or whatever and it's like yeah but i don't think you know what age you're living in now so tell me what age we're living in computer intelligence you know like i don't know like moon flights uh Men walking in space, you know? I think that you must be walking in space. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Tony is trying to convince Gino that what they plan to do is not going to work. It's not how things would... You need to, you know, kind of use a little more technology. You got to put a little more, you know, thought into it and all that. And Gino getting the wrong impression from judging Tony with his club and his friends. And it's like, oh, maybe you would rather want paper flowers than paper money. And, you know, and and I, I just want to know if you're in or out. And, you know, and Tony kind of basically backs down and chooses. He's like, I'm not going to be a part of this. And it's it's very interesting especially with <laughs> what happens shortly afterwards and so they sort of the conversation turns a bit sour and so uh tony leaves because they gave him that option because they i guess they wanted him to help with their heist it sort of just cuts to the opening credits uh which is daytime san francisco so i assume that the the rest like the whole beginning intro him escaping and then him meeting up at the club with uh, tony um is all that i assume takes place geographically somewhere near san francisco or even in that uh in california and i i'll get into how that sort of becomes a little bit (laughs) jarring plot wise per se but it's now daytime uh you get a nice little opening little opening title sequence helicopter shots and granted it's a little shaky but it still looks nice and you got the sort of like jazzy slow music that almost sounds like it's from a detective film like lethal weapon or something like that and then you're shown for the first time this sort of uh security truck at a like a bank or something and they're obviously they're transferring the money or something of value from one section to another for 1968 is absolutely 100% a little bit into science fiction territory. Like, it is very futuristic in a sense of what a ultimate security, secure truck could be. Like, it has, it's not revealed at first, but you got a guy inside the truck with this whole, like, station of uh, monitor and uh, buttons and stuff uh, that controls various aspects of the truck. Cameras throughout the truck, and then you got, like, mounted machine guns next to all those cameras and all that. Switch a switch, and not only do you have the radio transmission of talking to someone, but you also got the video equivalent of, like, Skype (laughs) or, uh, zoom at this point and it's like it's very like it kind of took me back because i was like whoa they they're actually even though the movie itself is pretty grounded per se in the late 60s i like how the security truck is just that little bit of movie magic that little bit of the right amount of futuristic stuff like if you remove the wheels made it hover with strings and it could very well be a something out of a Gary Anderson production like the movie sort of made the security truck like no other impenetrable and this fortress <laughs> on wheels and it's just 
I, I love it so much. I love the sort of design of the truck. It, it's it's you can tell they sort of took some liberties with the sort of it's a, it's a, it's a little bit it adds a little bit of sci-fi to it without it like you know it's not flying vehicles it's not you know something totally absurd it's just the right amount of futuristic and I kind of really love that the movie has this. So Gino and his merry men in San Francisco after following the truck for several miles across the bridge and all that they uh attack and spring into action <laughs> one guy has a bazooka <laughs> and i guess that was their plan to get into the vehicle because they're like oh well that's that's gonna open the door imagine finding someone who looks at you the way the rocket launcher guy looks at the guy reloading it <laughs> you get to see the security truck in action to make a long story short, the the heist did not go well. <laughs> and they the the two rockets of the bazooka and they they weren't able to actually even open the door. They were able to shake the guy off the uh, ch- chair, but wasn't able to actually physically able to get inside and by then the police have already arrived and gino who's weirdly hesitant throughout this like i'm not sure why he's so dear in the headlights a bit with this scene like you think the plan would have been a little more bought out like i don't know if they rushed in they were like literally the next day after he escapes from prison they're like oh yeah help us attack this truck and then not give him any details or whatever because that's the only only way i can think of why he's so frozen here um instead of running off or getting into another vehicle with other people unfortunately gino doesn't make it along with i think everybody else actually i think i don't even think anybody actually escaped i would have to (laughs) remember if that was the case or whatever and kind of a big little bit leap of coincidence is it just so happens after Gino gets shot and there's you know a crowd gathering above on the bridge above it just so happens that Tony from earlier is one of the people there and he just so happens to see Gino lying there dead and um surprisingly from that distance he was actually able to identify him actually if I'm gonna be completely honest because I'm like my eyesight's good but I don't think my eyesight's that good and then we have this back and forth moment of of dramatic look to dramatic look editing that just kind of makes the scene hit home or even a little more more and it's just it's kind of it's a little bit funny but at the same time it's like you know it's serious but it's just the back and forth shots end up going a lot longer than what you thought it was gonna go (laughs) and then uh, we finally it fades to black and then it cuts to fabulous Las Vegas. And it's like, what's I found very interesting is, I just thought it was kind of weird that it's like, supposedly this whole heist thing is in, in San Francisco. And then he's, Tony's there. And then all of a sudden it's like, now he's in Las Vegas and he's working as a car dealer. And that was kind of, for me, was a little bit of a stretch to get into the film. Because it's like, you didn't necessarily need to have it in San Francisco, hypothetically. You could have maybe done the Geno failed heist and in near Las Vegas or, you know, at one of the more lesser casinos or something like that and show them trying it in Las Vegas or maybe something like that because it's just, it's just, because I know Las Vegas is in the grand schemes of things kind of close to San Francisco compared to you know any other place like you know it's not saying you know it's new york to san francisco which is obviously a long long more distance but it's like like san francisco to las vegas is kind of doable and i'm sure there's people who drive between las vegas and san francisco all the time it's just i just thought it was kind of weird especially when first being introduced and then all of a sudden it's like why was he why was tony there in the first place in san francisco why was and it, like if i worked in las vegas i wouldn't be like oh i'm just want to go to some club in san francisco like does he do this does does he travel weekly to go relax in san francisco on his weekdays off or like that's 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 the it was it was a little thing i got sort of caught up on but it's just it was from here on out it didn't really matter where the beginning take place and so 
for for a first time viewing it was a bit jarring i felt just location wise and all of a sudden uh, character wise and it's like oh now he's a blackjack dealer working in las vegas and it's like how long has he been working there that's where he normally works or like like i had these questions and i'm going to be completely honest here if i was making the film i would have actually had the opening main titles be when it switches over to las vegas and then that way when it says they came to rob las vegas it's not showing a skyline of san francisco but that is if i was making the film which i didn't but yes we do get a really really nice video montage of las vegas and i i think that might be the only one that we get in this film but it is a very good one at the reveal of Tony working for the casino. Uh, we also are introduced to Anne, played by Elk Summer. And she is winning very well at the blackjack table. And it turns out, you know, the pit boss comes over, gives a little line about how, oh, she keeps winning. coming. She keeps coming back every w- weekend and uh, keeps winning and then leaving. And, and it's like, oh, huh, she's very, very lucky, you know? And it's like nothing suspicious here. Tony and Anne are working together and are in love with one another and are, they were just slowly making some quick bucks from the casino in that way. They mentioned it was uh, about $400 that she won, and by today's conversion rates, that is about $3,000 US. So that's not bad. The most I've ever won from a blackjack in a casino is maybe 10 bucks. <laughs> so that's 10 bucks Canadian. You know that was even less <laughs> when you convert it to America. And then once again, we're shown these security trucks loading uh, cash into it uh, from one of the banks in Las Vegas. And it's uh, this time we see Tony trail the truck and see where it's going, map, route, route wise. It is revealed through the <laughs> Skype Zoom call on the truck that Ann is working for the same company that runs the security trucks. And for a first time viewing, this is kind of weird. Because usually in the movies, this is, uh, in heist movies, the more modern day ones, is everything gets set up. Everything is, it's like a, okay, we need a specialist. We need somebody to do this. We need somebody to do that. And then as they're talking, usually it's shown them figuring out how to do it and all that. And, and it's just interesting that this movie is just sort of already kind of has things in place. And we have a bit of a major scene a little bit later on where it's confronted in a hotel room between Tony and Anne where Anne says, how long have you been working at the casino when you met me and um, found out, you know, I work for the same security company and she talks about Tony's plan to rob the security trucks and the like the like the way I, I see her acting is she's she loves tony but she's afraid that tony doesn't love her and she's afraid that maybe tony's just using her it's like do you love me or do you just love the money and it's like it's revealed near the end of the film uh what tony's true intention with the heist was and uh on a first viewing it's it's good but on 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 second and third viewing it's kind of like well he could have just been straightforward with her i mean you don't have to keep it vague and you know not acknowledge the money but not really acknowledge her at the same time you know and is kind of the the key to the entire heist without her there wouldn't have been no no way to attempt the heist at least smartly like without you know running in there with a bazooka like earlier but even then that failed so you would kind of need somebody on the inside and it's like the movie already sets it up instantly and it's like we don't even we don't even know how long she's been working there we don't know like we don't see how tony or ann met or anything like that so it's just sort of it's like they didn't the movie felt like it didn't need that and, and to be honest, I don't know if the movie actually needed that because everything is sort of, I guess, subtext through the film. <laughs> and then we are introduced to Lee J. Com playing Steve Skaz- Skazor- Skaskorsky. 
but he's the owner of the company, the Siskorsky Security, the uh, head guy who started the company and all that, and, and is running the security trucks and all that. Lee J. Cobb plays quite, quite a little slime ball in this movie. Like, it's nothing, like, over the top or nothing, like, major, but it's just very, just enough that you're like, wow, I can't believe this guy, you know? <laughs> but it's nothing, like, shocking or, like, totally, you know, out of left field. It's just, just very minorly <laughs> things. Like, the scene where we met on me sort of hits on um, Anne, and she's, like, his personal secretary then all of a sudden on the on the intercom it's like uh steve your uh, wife is on line one or whatever or like <laughs> and so it's like oh and then you know so during tony's uh, watching of the truck we end up seeing a helicopter at one point and it turns out when the helicopter uh, radios in to another car sitting and waiting somewhere in the area it turns out that the u.s treasury is actually looking into and investigating steve skorsky and his uh, line of trucks of security trucks uh because of possible illegal money issue things wink wink nudge nudge main treasury investigator douglas is his character and it's played by Jack Palance. I'm gonna, I might as well mention this right now, but Jack Palance in this movie reminds me a lot of like younger Clint Eastwood in like the No Man, the Man with No Name trilogy and stuff like that. And it's like, take that, but then put him in a dirty, hairy role, but without the gun. Like it's just the investigation side of Dirty Harry. That's Jack Pounce's role in this movie. And that's what it reminds me of. You can knock off now. We'll uh, try again on another trip. And thanks. Anyways, so way after confronting Tony in the hotel room, after some time thinking about the heist, and Anne has come to the decision to go through and help Tony with the heist, and to give him the information that he needs to plan it out properly and go through with it. Then we come to the part of the film where we get to know our heist crew a bit more after uh, a driving scene, which I, I guess this would be a good time to mention the music, but I just realized that now it is actually the same song that is used in the club in the earlier part of the film. It's literally exact same there's actually the song in the hotel room when Anne confronts Tony is the same song I believe they use in the end credits as well. So you can really tell from this movie it is a little more on the low budget side, if the especially given how much they're reusing the music. But I, I do praise the fact that I never actually noticed that they were reusing the music as I was watching this film for the first time. Because usually in a film, when they reuse a music, it's noticeable and the fact that in this film i didn't actually notice that they reused the music is like i get i gotta give it some praise there you know so during this whole heist setup scene i kind of thought something was a little bit off tony i don't get it all the police have to do is roadblock both ends and we've had it that's right and you figure to open that mother and be out of there in less than an hour dear boy not in your wildest dreams Sal figures four days if we have to cut. Four days? My three-year-old kid sister could do it faster. Will Mother Borsi be using his false teeth? <laughs> all this time, what's the police supposed to be doing? Bringing in fresh supplies of false teeth for Mama Borsi. <laughs> Tony, the police will be combing every square foot in the area. Yeah. What happens to us in the truck? White magic. My fairy godmother appears and makes us and the truck just vanish into thin air. Hmm, that's right. And I'm not sure if this is true or not, but this is the part of the film, more than 30 minutes into the film, that I actually kind of noticed that it seems that this movie is, on, especially on certain characters, is dubbed. And I'm just not sure 
is it just because I'm not used to watching these older films with the audio the way it is? Or if maybe, in fact, I'm right and, and they did actually dub over a lot of the lines. And uh, some of the older movies are kind of a little bit known for that. Like, uh, especially early on in the James Bond franchise, there was a lot of uh, supporting cast members that were dubbed over because they felt that the accent might have been a little too thick or uh, didn't, I don't know, sound as clear for what they consider would be acceptable for American audiences. So um, I think this movie kind of has that, and it's um, it's kind of interesting because a lot of spaghetti westerns are kind of known as well for not having the dialogue be as synced or, or having it sound like it's a bit dubbed over. So I don't know if this movie was like that, but it... it this scene makes me think that there is certain aspects of this film that's definitely been dubbed. Hey, lover. How'd you like to get him for the Playmate of the Month, huh? <laughs> so anyways, their plan is the following. The truck, when it's moving money from Las Vegas to Los Angeles, when it reaches a certain part of the desert... It's going to get stuck. They're going to shoot out the tires. When the truck goes into lockdown, they're going to burn the front of the car to with a flamethrower to get the guys out of the driver's seat. At the same time, I forgot to mention earlier, they would knock out the communication tower so they won't have any visuals between the, between the service company, service truck company, and the truck itself uh, they will still have an emergency backup radio but it's gonna take them longer it's gonna still take about a police about an hour to reach there what they did prior in the desert is that they dug out this hole nearby the road but far enough that it's out of the way of the road and a hole big enough that it could fit the truck and some of the equipment and crew around cover it up and have it sort sort of so it's like it's like a little hideaway and then from the air have the helicopter blow the sand around so that way it just looks like it's just another part of the desert and when they deal with the truck then they're gonna push the truck and get it out of the little hill section that they did using these tire track things that they have to keep putting in front of the wheel to get it to slowly move its way up the sand dune to where the hole is. And then they, when they get it inside, all the crew and everybody's going to be hiding in that hole. And they're going to be slowly figuring out a way to get using uh, equipment and that to unlock the door. Because the door of the back door that's guarding all the money and valuables is can only be opened by the guy that's on the inside. Which is the guy with the monitor. And so plan is is to wait it out over the, the four days or so. And then so the police are already... They're gone, and eh, I guess there's nothing we could do about it. So it's a pretty good plan, and it's a pretty uh, standout plan, and it's also a really good plan if you're trying to do a movie about robbing Las Vegas without actually having any of the heist happen in Las Vegas. It's a very clever way around it. From a filmmaking perspective, and from a story perspective, it's like being a more logical way around it per se. So I think it's it, I think it's quite good of a plan overall. The plan goes off without a problem, but literally just as way before at the beginning of the day when they're loading up the truck with the money, the feds with the from the treasury because they 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 figured this is going to be the one where Soskorsky is actually going to be moving the more illegal goods. They took control of the guy from the when they opened up the vault at the Las Vegas. They and they tied up the two that went in to get it. So the driver and the passenger for the front. They sort of tied them up and take care of them. And then when they got access to the, the middle of the truck, the guy in the middle sort of just keeps him in check and has him 
continue his day as normal because they want to see where the goods go and where they get dropped off and all that. And meanwhile, the treasury, they're staking out a the plane that they believe is going to be carrying the goods over the border. I love the fact that this movie actually kind of kind of had this almost like love triangle of cops and crime. You know, it's it's kind of like, OK, so you got the robbers who want to take the money from the company and then you got the the company who's kind of the service truck company that's um the head guy is actually technically using the company to do illegal transactions of moving i believe laundered money i'm not i i can't (laughs) <laughs> I don't remember off the top of my head. And then you got the feds who's investigating the service truck. And then it's like all three things sort of just collide in this one fateful day. And I just kind of really, really like that aspect of this film. For those who've made it this far into the video or audio, um, I would like to apologize because halfway through editing this video and I've decided that maybe I'm not cut out to describe an entire film in order, especially the fact that I'm not even, I'm just at the halfway point of the movie and it's already 50 minutes long, this uh, podcast style video (laughs) is. So uh, if you made it this far, thank you very much. Your support is appreciated. Um, I'm not going to go through the rest of the movie. I'm just going to go back to just be reviewing the film and the focus on what I think of the film because I'm basically at this point just going through the entire film and I'm missing details and it's driving me nuts uh, OCD wise and I am going to still be keeping this format at least for the next couple episodes for just watch just to see how it goes i apologize if you've been really enjoying my playthrough of or my walkthrough of they came to rob las vegas i'm sorry at the halfway point of the film when you finally they finally have the truck in the the hole and everything's going kind of well maybe (laughs) uh random uh pedestrian ends up accidentally seeing the helicopter that they were using during the heist so that ends up causing some shit When it turns into days and days of being inside, they're waiting for the cops to stop searching and all that in the desert. It it kind of turns into a little bit of a, it's almost like Reservoir Dogs. Because you got, you know, just after a heist, you see uh, the criminals all sort of coming together. And then, uh, you know, it sort of falls apart over time. And there's even an undercover cop in their midst. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I just realized that too. I I could see Reservoir Dogs being a little bit inspired by what happens in the whole part of the movie. Or maybe it's just the trope of heist movies where it's usually one or two crew members that usually ends up ruining the whole thing, you know. So the movie is basically far from over when you get to the point of the, the heist going through with it. You end up with everybody doing their, their own investigations of trying to figure out what's going on at the same time. I'm going through the movie, aren't I? Jesus. And I know Reservoir Dogs is basically lifted from, um, was it, I think the movie's called City on Fire, uh, which I have, which I have not watched yet, uh, which I need to watch. Like, the fe- overall feeling of what happens to the crew as they're trying to get into the truck is is very Reservoir Dogs-ish. I think it's structured very well, and I think what ha- ends up happening is, is kind of... I mean, it's bad for the the protagonist of the film, but it's, it's very, uh, suspense is entertaining and it is, uh, it's granted it's not exactly, I don't, I don't know if a little bit of it is executed as well. Like, you know, earlier we, we see a guy get shot and it lo- ends up looking a little more like a dance than an actual, you know, serious shooting. So you have little elements and all that. And at one point the main character does end up getting a bullet hole in in like his shoulder but the the, from where the bullet is it looks it's a little like where the blood effect is it on the clothes it looks like it might be a little more serious of an injury because i'm pretty sure that's near where the heart is (laughs) you know it's like little little things like that you understand what's happening it's it's not well executed masterpiece but it's it's (laughs) it works 
The film works, and it's quite enjoyable all the way up to the very end. In the terms of endings, this ending is a little bit memorable. Like, it's not as memorable, like, when compared to the original Italian job. Yeah, this uh, this ending is, like, little mem- memorable. It's not exactly that type of ending. So, it's um, very good. For, for They Came to Rob Las Vegas, the ending is satisfying. It's just not as complete or as... You don't get to see the fallout of the event as well, as much. And I was kind of wishing there was a little more to that. With what we d- end up do getting, it's still... I still think it's it's pretty pretty good of an ending. Granted, it's not as classic of an ending as, say, the Italian job. <laughs> Which I can't stop talking about enough. Because that's all I remember from that film, is that ending and how it made me feel. And then... But anyways, on the subject of They Came to Rob Las Vegas, I uh, like the end credits. Very simple design, but nice. Very of its time as well. The movie had a couple weirdly shot and edited moments, but they're kind of very interesting to watch overall, not gonna lie. And uh, I wanted to mention that earlier I mentioned somewhere in this review there is sort of a reveal why tony was going for the truck and and that and the funny thing is because i i skimmed for the movie for as i'm doing this recording back and forth because i thought i thought the bit the bit of a reveal is when he's sitting in the truck and he has access to the money now he sort of talks about gino's slightly and gino is the guy that died in the beginning and i actually thought it's mentioned in the film i actually thought i was under the impression that the reason he was going to rob uh that specific security truck is he was trying to just show that somebody could actually in fact break in and open up that truck unless i'm missing that scene and it happens elsewhere in the movie where he mentions that but i just thought that was sort of his motivation for it like he he he, i mean he cares about his money as much as you know it gets him for life but he's not like obsessed over the money he just wanted to you know prove that those type of trucks could be breaking in broken into people can get the money or the valuables or whatever just to prove the not prove the gino but like I guess he could be trying to prove to Gino as well his uh, spirit watching from a either above or below. <laughs> but I actually actually kind of thought that was the main sort of reason overall. But now that I think about it, uh, like going through it, I'm like, oh, he doesn't actually mention that. It's what I thought was his motivation for doing it. And it's like, wow, did I misinterpret it? Or am I right? Am I wrong? I don't know. Let me know in the comments below. Anyways... Thank you very much for watching. I want you to have a nice day or night or whatever time you watch this. Have a nice whenever. And uh, I'll leave you with just one more misunderstood moment of the movie um, that you can definitely tell how stupid I am as a person. When I first saw the film, I didn't realize the name of the guy at the beginning was Gino. At the end point of the movie where (laughs) tony kind of loses it and he says you know come on gino show him the truck and uh, i actually thought he was referring to the guy that was just about to blow up the security truck to get inside i actually thought that was the name of the character gino (laughs) so i thought he was referring to ah come on gino open up the truck show him where it is i thought it was kind of a he knew what was about to happen because he knows (laughs) the the guy that just went in to blow up the truck to get access to it so i i actually thought that gino was that character and so it's kind of funny how i misinterpret that (laughs) i'm such an idiot anyways as a little teaser next time on just watch this i will be watching for the very first time a 1950s classic sitcom called wandavision The sun will be coming up soon.